Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Don Miles, today's speaker. Uh, Don is a visiting professor here on sabbatical from Ohio University. And uh, before he'd arrived here, I'm not sure if we'd ever met before, but it's been really fun getting to know you while you've been here. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Um, so to give you a little bit of uh, background on Don's history, he did his undergraduate work here at Berkeley, and he worked with the illustrious Rob Colwell. And he grant am I allowed to give the years? Sure. You, you don't yeah. look old enough for your CV. Yeah. So, uh, so he, he got his bachelor's degree here in 1978. And actually, just before uh, the, the seminar here, Paul Licht introduced himself to Don, and Don responded, hey, you know, I took your class back in 1977. <laughs> it was surprising that Paul didn't remember him. <laughs> just from his, from his face, from his appearance. Yeah. I think he got an A+. Plus. A+. Plus. Actually, you checked your records. Oh, I never gave one. <laughs> So uh, after getting his bachelor's degree here, he got his master's degree at Cambridge with R.C. Campbell in 1979, and then he did his Ph.D. at University of Pennsylvania in 1985. He received his Ph.D. where he worked with Bob Rickliffs. So he's worked with some heavy hitters, and uh, it was really fun to look through your CV and uh, and see like who you worked with over the years. And you can see in the early days, actually through much of your career, you've done a lot of work with Art Dunham. That was some of the work that I was familiar with already. I've been reading his paper since I was a master's student. Uh, he's also done uh, a lot of work, obviously, with Rick Lips, with his advisor, uh, with his PhD advisor. And uh, then in more recent years, with Jonathan Losas, is another person you've collabor collaborated with extensively. And then starting in 2000, I think I've got the year right, uh, he initiated what's amounted to a very um, successful collaboration with Barry Sinervo. And there have been a lot of papers with, uh, with Barry. <coughs> I'm sure that the talk we'll hear today is also going to have a very Cinerbo flavor to it. There's some Cinerbo-esque stuff. Some Cinerbo-esque <laughs> stuff, exactly. So, uh, so Don, you know, is uh, I think of him as a herpetologist and as somebody who has a specialist in comparative <laughs> methods. He's written some really influential papers, especially on the comparative <coughs> method side of things. But a lot of his early work, not surprisingly, given his PhD advisor, uh, was with birds. So if you're an ornithologist, um, you may also want, not just a herpetologist, every herpetologist should want to talk to Don, but ornithologists should want to speak with him as well. Uh, do you still work on birds? Mm -hmm. And he still works on birds even to this day, even though I think of him as Mr. Eurosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that, I'm going to let Don uh, have the floor. He's going to take a lot of the work that he's been doing in recent years has been focused on the, effect, the effects of climate change, on essentially viability of populations, and of course I think that's going to play out role today. So thanks, Don. Great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's great to have a chance to speak to this crowd. Uh, the last time I, I gave a talk at the NBC was in 1985, I think it was, <laughs> when uh, Harry and I were working together on writing a, an NSF grant to pay for me to have a uh, postdoc here. Um, we didn't get it on the first round, and in between um, Submitting and resubmitting, I got a job. I asked Harry, is it okay if I resubmit the grant? He said, you wrote it. <laughs> so I did, I got the grant, and life went on from there. Um, I did go to Berkeley here, um, and uh, I just want to give a little background about um, the importance uh, that Berkeley played in my uh, development of my career, as well as um, working in the MVZ. So um, these are the among the people uh, that uh, influenced me. Um, I, I did take, uh, I guess it's IB 104, but in, in the old days it was Zoology 107, and the instructors for that course included uh, Professor Stebbins, um, Dr. Patton, Professor Patton, <laughs> and Ned. Uh, um, and uh, I got my start in ecology by taking a course with uh, Frank Patelka. And uh, so I took his uh, population ecology course and Rob's community ecology course uh, uh, during the same quarter. And uh, I practically died um, because I went from uh, a natural history perspective to a theoretical perspective. Um, I, uh, I also uh, had a course with uh, Professor Licht. Uh, and I, I took ornithology with Ned. Uh, I had to take a, a, a course um, in either ornithology or herpetology, and the two courses uh, conflicted, and uh, Ned's course uh, fit in my schedule, so I had uh, an opportunity. Oh. <laughs> I have some Ned stories, and I, um, uh, as we all do. Um, so I, I had an opportunity to, to uh, learn more about ornithology. And, and 
Uh, I also want to acknowledge my advisor, Daniel Mazia. He's a, 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 an important advisor that I had. He was an individual who taught cell physiology, and every time I saw him for an advising session, he always asked, are you going to take my cell physiology course? <laughs> and ultimately I did, and it was one of the best courses I ever att uh, attended. Uh, but he was also <coughs> instrumental in having me take uh, the marine biology course at Bodega Bay, because I said I wanted to be a field biologist. And he said, well, then you should take this course. I said, I think I know what I want. And he said, no, I think you're taking this course. <laughs> <laughs> and so I took the course, um, and I, I learned two things. One, I really did love being a field biologist. And two, I really wanted to be a vertebrate biologist. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to acknowledge uh, two uh, TAs that I had in uh, 107, uh, Russ Greenberg, uh, who just had a love of birds and a love of teaching. and really was great to be with in the field. And then uh, Jim Hankin, who was uh, a TA in um, uh, the second quarter of 107. And uh, he, he was interviewed by Ali G. Check it out on the internet. <laughs> so one of the things that was ingrained in me was the importance of natural history and the importance of field biology and essentially writing everything down. I mean, we had... Uh, the specter of Joe Cordell over us with every field course uh, or field trip in, in So 107. And you know, we would diligently write our field notes at the end of a field trip and hand it into the TA. <coughs> and we got to be very good observers of uh, nature, as you could be uh, when you're 21 or 22 or 23. But I want to talk about first the relationship between natural history and serendipity. And there's uh, a phrase or a saying, serendipity favors the prepared mind. I just want to go through some things that happened to me in the past few years that echoes uh, the importance of natural history and serendipity. Um, the, the first uh, phase of the Cinervo-esque uh, talk is um, uh, Barry and I are working together, um, teasing apart the, the mechanistic basis of the rock, paper, scissors uh, uh, dynamic in Yuda Stansburyana. And, and we got together because Yuda has this uh, color polymorphism in the throat, and the species that I work on, uh, Eurosaurus ornatus, also has uh, uh, polymorphism in uh, the throat band. <laughs> now, the things that we were interested in was the maintenance of these color polymorphisms and the relationship between a polymorphic uh, group of species and the rates of speciation. And that's uh, the, the genesis of our collaboration. That and Malbec wine. <laughs> um, now, in about, I think it was 2007, Barry was, was teaching and he had a new student, Beth Bastions, who wanted to um, look at a system in Mexico that would be a, a good test of the rock, paper, scissors dynamic. Um, and so we decided uh, that Scalopus gramicus uh, would be an, uh, an excellent species with which to investigate the generality of the rock, paper, paper scissors dynamic. And we, we talked with Jack Seitz about potential sites, and we also talked with Fausto Mendes de la Cruz. Uh, Fausto had worked on Scalopus gramicus for his dissertation work, and he had field sites throughout Mexico, and, and you can't see it, but we focused on sites just to the west of uh, Mexico City and to the east. Uh, and the eastern site was uh, a place called Cerro Tolman, and the uh, western site was Ajusco, uh, which is a, a, mount, a montane site um, in the uh, Cordillera west of the city. So I went with Beth, and we went to Fausto's sites. We're looking for lizards. We're looking for this species. Um, and Scalopris are not exactly the easiest lizard to miss. They're, <laughs> they bask. They display. And so we went to Fausto's site, and we couldn't find uh, Scalopris gramicus to save our life. We found Scalopris torquatus. We found another Scalopris, but not gramicus. So we called up Fausto. We said, hey, man, we went to your site, and there weren't any Gramicus. And you know, his uh, uh, comment was, I'll come out and show you. So he comes out, <coughs> goes to the site. There's no, there's no Gramicus. He says, I don't understand. They were here 15 years ago. So he said, let's go to Ahusco. 
It's just a four-hour drive across Mexico City. <laughs> and we'll go to that site. So we go to Ojusco. And this is um, about 1,500 meters in elevation. Uh, Sarah Dolman was about the same. We go to Fausto's old site. There's, there's no Rambicus. There, there's Scalopris policiosi and a Crotalis triceriatus. That was nice. But, but Beth wanted these. So uh, Fausto said, let's go up in elevation. So we go up to about 2,500 meters, something like that. We find Rambicus. So I asked Fausto, um, do you think this might be a signature of climate change? He says, I don't know. I mean, we just have you know, two points. Uh, it's not enough. All right, so later, um, uh, Fausto, Barry, and I uh, wanted to go sample uh, some individual localities <laughs> where um, species uh, in the Scalopris scleris group uh, have been described as having uh, throat color polymorphism. Uh, so we go to the uh, regions in the northern part of Mexico and hit these montane <coughs> sites looking for um, individuals of each of these species. Now, uh, these are some figures taken from uh, Grummer et al. Uh, from 2013 in uh, Systematic Biology. But we had two species for our target. One was Sam Colmani, and the other was um, Scalopris gold mining. Um, so uh, our goal was to assess parity of the populations. There was some uh, data to suggest that uh, some of the species or populations were not uh, viviparous. And then, again, we wanted to verify the presence of morphs. <coughs> so we go to the uh, sites, and we find evidence of local extinction, again, even at one of the type localities for the species. Uh, and this is Sam uh, Golmani. Uh, we also found the presence of a low elevation species, Scalopris parvus. And in fact, we visited various sites, and every time we saw Scalopris parvus, we knew we would not see one of the high elevation species. And that's part two. Uh, part three. Uh, later that year, Barry and uh, Fausto went to survey populations of Scalopris serifer in the Yucatan Peninsula. Fausto had worked there as well. Um, and they went to visit some sites. They found extinct sites, so some populations that had uh, disappeared. But they also found extant sites. And Fausto said, what if we put some data loggers to see what differences there might be uh, between these extinct populations and the extant populations? So they did. Uh, and this is what they found. Uh, this top panel shows the number of hours uh, that the uh, data loggers reported temperatures that were above the mean field active body temperature of the lizard. Now, Scalopris serifer is a viviparous species, and during the breeding season, the females regulate their body temperatures rather low. So at the extinct sites in January, um, the uh, number of hours that were above the body temperature, the field active temperature was about four, whereas in the extant sites, there's not much difference in um, uh, the uh, number of, or there's no difference in the number of hours that uh, uh, the environmental temperature was above TB. As you get into the warmer months, and, and this is a period of time that the uh, species uh, has uh, gestation, you find that late in the, in the season, uh, about four hours of the day, you have temperatures above TB. Yet, if you go to the extinct sites, up to 13 hours of the day, the temperatures are above the mean field active TB. Essentially, females could come out for 30 minutes and have to retreat. And in fact, what <coughs> Barry and Fausto found was they could find lizards at about 7 or 8 in the morning, and after that, they wouldn't find any lizards. <coughs> this is just a plot to show that the um, hours above the preferred body temperature relative to the uh, difference between the maximum uh, ambient temperature and body temperature, as um, this increases, as the difference between the maximum temperature and the preferred or the field active body temperature increases, um, the hours that the animals are uh, forced into refugia increases. 
And so what we found, uh, or what Barry and, and Fausto found, is that there is a change in the climate space and a constraint on the activity time. So in these red bars, it's too hot during the day for the lizards to be active. So we have this idea that there might be some constraint on the activity of lizards based on <coughs> um, uh, ambient temperature. So um, Barry, Faust, and I started talking, and we asked, has there been any, any evidence of, of temperature change in Mexico? And so we uh, gathered up uh, climate data from um, 90 me meteorological stations in Mexico, and we uh, got data from 1978 to 2008. And the key thing here is we've got the different months of the year, January through April, May through August, September through December. And the, the interesting thing we found is that the main increase in temperature was January through April. That red part indicates an increase of uh, about 0.3 degrees, uh, or sorry, 3 degrees over that period of time. Now, this is also the period of time where viviparous scolopris are carrying young in utero. And so the areas where the temperature has increased the most is also the areas where the viviparous species <coughs> are found. And what we did is we conducted a massive resurvey, Fausto marshaled all of his grad <coughs> students, to go out and resurvey sites that scolopris had historically been captured. And these dots are the sites, and uh, based on the uh, presence or absence of the lizards at these uh, recapture sites, we were able to construct the probability of extinction. And we recorded out of um, 200 sites something on the order of about 15% uh, local extinctions. And based on that, uh, we can look at the trend in extinctions for the viviparous and for the oviparous. Now, the oviparous tend to have a buffer because females lay the eggs in um, nests below the ground, and females can select the nest sites, but the viviparous species can't. And so by 2080, we see that there's going to be large swaths of Mexico that would be um, inhospitable for um, viviparous scolopris. Okay, And this is attributed to this restriction in the time available for lizards to be active during the day. Okay. Let's switch gears. We have a concurrent study on a different continent. This time it's with uh, our colleagues Benoit, Hulain, Jean uh, Claubert, uh, Barry, and myself. And in this case, it's also the pursuit of uh, the generality of uh, mating system dynamics and color polymorphic species. So Barry started uh, <coughs> surveying populations of this uh, organism, Zotoka or Lacerda Vipra, And the males have a, a polymorphism on the venter. Uh, there are white males, uh, there are yellow males, and then there are orange males. Um, and the, the key thing about this species is it's one of the broadest uh, 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 one of the vertebrates with the broadest distribution um, on the planet. Its range goes from uh, Spain all the way to Asia. And for most of the populations throughout the range, the species is viviparous. Uh, in Spain and in Italy, they're oviparous. Now, by they're, they're <coughs> largely ovoviviparous. There's no matrotrophy or exchange of nutrients between the, the um, um, embryos and, and the mother. There is exchange of, of water. But we have these... Uh, uh, two uh, or three groups of, of uh, populations, and, and they also belong to different clades. So we have an oviparous clade in Spain, an oviparous clade in Italy and the Pannonian Basin, and then the rest of the uh, populations are viviparous. So in uh, the late 80s, uh, Serge Groba and Benoit Hulain did some surveys uh, largely for the, uh, the purpose of doing a phylogeographic analysis of, of Lacerda, uh, Vivipara, um, and um, also to, to evaluate uh, the 
uh, distribution of viviparity and oviparity in the species. Now, the interesting thing is, um, for the oviparous clades, the males are color polymorphic, and in the viviparous clades, the females are <coughs> polymorphic in coloration. But <coughs> they, they were able to, to survey about 100 different sites. And Barry came along, and he, he was interested in, well, what's the pattern of color polymorphism in the species? So we had uh, one group of surveys. This was part of a global change project initiated by Barry and Jean, surveying 20 populations in the Massif Central. Uh, and with Benoit, me and Barry, we surveyed in the Pyrenees. And then there was a pan-European collaboration looking at the evolution of reproductive strategies. And this group surveyed 100 plus <coughs> sites across Europe. Now these re these resurveys <coughs> found extinctions. Um, and it, where there were re uh, surveys that found extinctions, these were resurveyed. And we found about 13% of the uh, populations that um, were initially surveyed by Serge Grobant and uh, Benoit uh, showed extinctions. <clears throat> now the, the, the thing about this lizard is it lives in a bog. And if you ever work with desert lizards and uh, have attempted to work with boggy lizards, it's quite a change. Boggy <laughs> lizards don't like dry. They don't like hot. Um, so this is a, a, a peat bog in the Pyrenees. This is a site that Benoit has studied for uh, 15 or so years, uh, Gabas. <coughs> and then uh, this is an extinct site um, uh, in lower elevation and not too far from Gabas. This is Buzi. Uh, we surveyed here. Uh, we go there every year, and um, we haven't found lizards. So this is a persistent extinct site. So what was different about these um, extinctions? Well, one of the things uh, that we did is we looked at whether there was any sort of pattern with respect to geographic uh, uh, localities. And <clears throat> we found, if you look at the extinction probability, that extinction probability went up as you went down in elevation. Extinction probability <laughs> went up as you uh, moved to the east, or sorry, uh, to the south, and it went up as you moved to the east. These red dots represent the extinction uh, localities, and the green dots represent persistent localities. What is <coughs> driving this? Well, we looked at some weather data, and we considered three different variables. One, something called a break point. And this is a, a weather station that exhibited a significant jump in warm spells. Then there was a break date, and this is the year that the break point was observed. And then from these two, we calculated a warm spell duration index. Now you might remember in 2003 that Europe was gripped by a heat wave. Temperatures of over 100 degrees were registered for the first time in uh, many places uh, in France and, and um, England. Last year we were sampling lizards. We had temperatures exceeding 37 degrees throughout July. Uh, and we were running an experiment with 500 females in a lab. and. The experiment was a warm treatment of 32 degrees and a cool treatment of 28. One day the average lab temperature was 40 degrees. We had, to, and it's not very easy to find an air conditioner in France, so <laughs> we had to find an air conditioner to keep the animals from overheating. So this warm spell duration was something that we thought about um, uh, based on our, our experiences in the past few years. So we were able to get data from 494 weather stations, and these red dots represent all the stations that registered a breakpoint. Right. So these are stations that had um, significantly longer warm spells. Now if you look at the pattern, if you look at the probability of extinction, the intensity of the warm spell predicted the extinctions that we observed in Lacerda, or Zotoka. And we could also look at the density change um, as a function of the intensity of the increase in the hot spells. And the density of populations that we surveyed went down as warm spells went up. Okay, if you look at the pattern of extinctions and then the distribution of these uh, geographic uh, localities for the warm spells, we find that the maximum warm spell duration index is in August, which is also the time that the Lacerta are either giving birth 
or the females have oviposited the eggs in a peat bog. And what happens is it becomes too hot to sustain the development of the embryos. And so you have the eggs desiccating, or in the case of the neonates, they're born in an extremely hot and dry environment. And the neonates need water. Um, if the neonates are not given water, they can, can dehydrate and die within five to six hours. So it's a critical thing for the neonates. Okay, so here we have some natural history data with the goal not of looking for extinctions, but to look for patterns of color polymorphisms in a lizard. And we find uh, an extinction event with Scoloporus, which is based on hours of extinction, and Zotoka that is based on population collapse from low recruitment. So what could be the mechanism? What is the, uh, the, the, the dynamic that might be responsible for this? Well, we know that there are rising temperatures and alteration in rainfall patterns. This is a photograph from um, uh, one of Blair Wolf's uh, presentations. You see the shrub, and you see all this green. These aren't leaves, these are budge riggers. So what we're seeing in Australia, and this is something that Blair is interested in, is these extreme heat events that are killing uh, uh, species like uh, budger riggers and, and others. So rising temperatures and alteration of rainfall patterns are a pervasive threat to global ecosystems. And um, the, the, the bottom line is that we're going to see a warmer world, um, particularly as you look at different uh, <coughs> scenarios with respect to the rates of carbon increase and the different kinds of uh, global circulation models and the period of time under which we examine those. Um, I think this was what uh, was giving you night chills, Steve, is the trying to come up with all the mechanisms that climate change might operate. So it's not only that, that temperatures are going to rise, but we're going to see things like an increase in uh, the duration of droughts, the frequency of droughts, the reduction in uh, snow and ice. I was in uh, Argentina two years ago, and we were at a national park near San Juan, Argentina, and the rangers at the park recorded rainfall for the first time on the glacier. Normally they get snow. So we're seeing this massive reorganization of climatic patterns, and we have the problem of determining how species will respond. So we all know that there's three possible uh, avenues of response, distributional changes, um, adaptation, either through an evolutionary response or plasticity, and then the failure to adapt would be extinction. Um, so the biotic consequences of changes in abiotic factors includes altered habitat characteristics, changes in thermal opportunities, the potential risk of dehydration, and a combination of these two also means lower net primary productivity and lower food availability combined with <coughs> higher metabolic costs. Right? Warmer temperatures for an ectotherm means higher costs of existence. So one of the things that Barry, me, Clobert, and our co uh, collaborators are interested in is, can physiology and behavior douse the fire of climate change, to borrow uh, Ray Huey's phrase. Ray Huey's also involved in this. And so one of the things about climate change is that you have two patterns. One is the long-term trend, and you can view climate change as a, a chronic stressor, if you want to think about it in terms of the physiological response to a stressor. And then there are short-term changes uh, acute stressors. So this would be like a, an extreme climatic event. Um, and so the response of an organism will depend on the temporal <laughs> duration and magnitude of the response. If the, resp if the uh, stressor is predictable you, and, and of a long duration, you might have uh, an adaptive response being predict uh, uh, possible. But if it's a, uh, an unpredictable response, a short duration, plasticity might be uh, the key. And this all depends on the um, intrinsic characteristics of the organism. It depends on the generation time, the re re reproductive rate, <coughs> um, and the body size of the organism. And so for, for the, the, the rest of the talk, I'll focus more on small ectothermic organisms rather than 
um, large bodied organisms. So uh, one way to visualize how climate change can operate is to consider climate change as altering the thermal environment. And so you have this, the, the, the behavior of an organism and its morphology that transduces these thermal environments into a realized body temperature. This realized body temperature will affect short-term performance. And in turn, performance will affect growth, <coughs> survivorship, and reproduction, fitness. There's a feedback level. If there's uh, sufficient uh, genetic variation and a strong enough uh, selection gradient, you may see changes <coughs> such that you have shifts in the body temperature um, uh, attained by uh, a species. Okay, so the measurement of performance is usually um, something like sprint speed, endurance, digestion, hearing. Ray, Ray Huey in his 1982 review has uh, several dozen different uh, performance measurements. But the key thing in, is in most ectotherms you see this characteristic asymmetric shape where you have two points that anchor the curve, the CT min and CT max. These are the critical thermal minima and maximum. There's some optimal temperature for performance. And um, there is uh, a span of temperatures which defines the thermal tolerance breadth. So this is basically the range of temperatures an animal can be active. <laughs> and then there's also going to be a performance breadth. I believe that uh, uh, there was uh, some work done by uh, Paul, both on the whole organismal performance as well as the performance of enzymes at different temperatures. The other thing about uh, the environment um, integrating uh, behavior and realized body temperature and performance is that you can't assume the environment is flat. And this is some work that Mike Sears, uh, Lee Fitzgerald, and I have been doing. And, and depending on the rugosity or the roughness of the topography, that can adjust the times that organisms are uh, able to be active. It's difficult to see, but if you have a flat shape, you have a uniform curve where you have restricted activity throughout most of the day. Rugosity allows animals to be active at uh, a larger proportion of time, and then highly uh, rugose surfaces allows even more time for activity. And depending on the amount of activity, you have a change in the potential activity budget, which feeds back on the interaction between performance and fitness. <coughs> OK, so thermal performance curves have been critical in, in ascertaining how species can respond to climate change, largely through uh, an examination of the difference between the CT min and max <laughs> and the average body temperature uh, lizards or any other organism displays in the field. And it's assumed that <coughs> TB um, displayed by animals in the field is um, uh, corresponding to the optimal temperature for performance. Now one of the things that we expect is and, and species that are found in more stable or predictable climates that you should see uh, this curve showing a more narrow breadth and uh, more peakedness, and a generalist having a broader curve, which allows the animal to perform well or across a wider range of temperatures, given that they are likely to experience more seasonal environments. Now, behind this, there's also this idea about the difference between static and lability and thermal performance curves. Uh, a large uh, literature um, has uh, discussed that these curves are not likely to shift, that is they're static or conserved, and there's growing evidence to suggest that these curves can be labile and acted upon by selection. So the principal parameters of these thermal performance curves are again these two traits, the tolerance range, um, the optimal, <coughs> breadth of, uh, uh, optimal performance temperature, the breadth of optimal performance, either at 95% or 80%, and then the shape of the curve. And most analyses ignore the shape. They present either these, 
two values and then some measurement of optimal temperature or preferred temperature, or only consider these parameters. So one of the questions is, does the operative temperature or the operative environmental temperature exceed CT max? And in a study published a couple years ago by uh, Jennifer Sunday, in a large review of um, the uh, values for CT max and the environmental temperature, um, they found that um, there's a thermal safety zone defined where this maximum uh, critical temperature is greater than the operative temperature. And then there's a thermal danger zone where CT max is less than TE. And you find that a lot of the data shows that most species in the reptiles fall into this zone. <clears throat> so they have uh, a high thermal danger. Insects are uh, on either side, but there's not much data. And then amphibia, because they have wet skin, are protected in some ways, but still there are quite a few species that are in the thermal danger zone. <clears throat> and one can look at the difference between CT max and T max against latitude, and we see that uh, most of the species that are in the danger zone fall into the tropical regions, and then you have uh, a group of species that are broadly distributed, and these are largely species that have high uh, thermal tolerances and um, live in uh, typically arid, uh, arid zones. But the overlooked variable is voluntary thermal minimum. Animals do not stay out until it, the temperature reaches its critical thermal maximum. They retreat. They don't emerge below their uh, some critical thermal minimum. They wait until the environmental temperature um, reaches some threshold, and then they come out. And, and so if you look at these two, these values integrate the behavior of the organism and the physiology. And this is also where natural history comes into play. If one watches a lizard, a lizard will emerge from uh, its retreat site and it sticks its beak out, just, you know, just enough to warm the head. It warms the head up and then it emerges a little more and then it reaches a body temperature that seems to be sufficient. I won't say optimal, but it's sufficient and then they start to uh, emerge, bask, and feed. Um, this is a repeatable pattern in, in Eurosaurus. So, one thing we find is that this critical thermal minimum is rarely approached in the wild. Most, uh, uh, most examples of uh, Eurosaurus populations I've sampled, the, the, the voluntary minimum is about 25. And the voluntary maximum um, was <coughs> about 39. In recent years, this has shifted up to 41 uh, to 42 degrees. Um, and this has shifted up to 27 degrees. So the voluntary thermal limits often are substantially different than the critical thermal limits. Okay, so how, how can we integrate this? Well, I'm going to talk about two things. One is, um, in addition to the uh, thermal safety zone, is, is the hours of restriction sufficient to predict extinction risk? And um, Mike Carney uh, looked at the data that was published in um, the science paper, and he asked, well, how does shade affect the ability of organisms to persist in these environments? And, and he looked at the potential activity globally for an ectotherm with a three degree increase in temperature and 90% shade availability. Um, and you can see that there's uh, some areas in the uh, tropics where there's still uh, some restriction on activity, but by and large, the, the uh, accountability or the accounting of shade increases the amount of activity time available. If you look at the change in diurnal activity with no temperature change and a reduction in shade, you see that the amount of activity available, so the darker the red, the less activity is possible, um, the animals get hammered. So uh, Carney suggested we need to include shade in addition to temperature. In, in accounting for the response of organisms to climate change. So um, he, he looked at our data, and this is just a plot of the change in the net reproductive rate, or R, R sub zero. These blue dots, there's a positive increase in R sub zero. The red is negative. 
This is with uh, 0 to 90 percent shade. Uh, this is with 0 to 50 percent shade. These yellow crosses coincide with our extinct sites. Um, and um, with a reduction in shade, you find that there's a greater risk of uh, uh, population declines because of the uh, reduction in the hours of activity. Okay, so I, I thought, well, let me look at some of the data that's available for your source. Um, this is a plot of the modified Palmer Drought Severity Index. When it's positive, it's wet. When it's negative, it's dry. This goes from 1985 to 2006. Uh, you see that um, over the course of the past um, 20 or so years, um, the number of drought episodes has increased, <coughs> and the uh, duration of drought has increased. The intensity of drought seems to be more or less the same. The wet years are fewer and of shorter duration. <coughs> what does that do to the environment? Well, here we have um, a, a nice pastoral scene, a couple of lizards basking, some trees, the sun. Let's say it goes up three degrees. Now it becomes too warm to be on a rock, and you see a shift in the substrate use. So you see animals starting to use trees as a uh, substrate for their activity. So either they shift in their use of substrate, or there's a reduction in activity. In fact, there's a paper by Sheffers, I think in 2011, that arboreality is a response to climate change. Well, it can't get too hot and too dry, and you have the loss of uh, appropriate arboreal substrates because of drought stress. Okay, okay so I looked at uh, some uh, patterns of activity for your source. This is uh, the habitat that I study. It's in uh, the Suar National Park in Tucson, Arizona on the eastern side of the city. Actually, it's almost surrounded by the city now. Uh, this is a mesquite tree. It's about three meters tall. It's not exactly the most hospitable looking uh, mm -hmm. shrub. This is the same tree in a wet year. So there's a lot of grass, but not much growth. This is a tree in a normal wet year. Uh, so lots of uh, uh, foliage, high amounts of uh, insect activity, lots of primary productivity, even for a desert. Okay, well what happens with uh, this piece? This is Eurosaurus ornatus. Um, so there's a tremendous change in the operative uh, temperature experienced by lizards in drought and uh, wet years. This gray line is a drought year. The black line traces the temperatures uh, at a given tree, the same tree actually, um, in a uh, wet year. This is the CT max for Eurosaurus and the field active TB. What you find is that during the drought year, the activity is reduced such that lizards are largely inactive between 11 o'clock during the day, and they can't emerge again until uh, almost uh, uh, 20 hundred. So the sunset is around 6.30 to 7.30 in Arizona, because uh, Arizona is on um, Mountain Standard Time. So lizards actually have a compressed time of activity. Well, what's happened uh, in terms of the physiological characteristics? Well, I, I went into the literature, and it turns out uh, Licht published uh, some preferred temperatures for Eurosaurus in 1961. In 1997, I measured the preferred temperatures for uh, Eurosaurus. Uh, I think this was in Tucson, wasn't it? Well, that's way back then, never mind. <laughs> <coughs> so the preferred body temperatures here, it's about 37 degrees in 1961, uh, about 37 uh, degrees in uh, 1997. I remeasured it and went up to 39 degrees in uh, 2013. I remeasured it last year and uh, 2014, and it's still high. There's been a shift in the body temperature preferred by your source. Now, whether that's plastic or a genetic response, we're doing some common garden experiments next year to, or this coming summer to find out. But there has been a shift in T-PREF over the past 26 years. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, by shifting the, the T-PREF up, that in, increases the range of activity available for the lizard. So you find that the lizards are active. 
but at a cost. So they're active, but they're at higher body temperatures. So the average field body temperature used to be about 37. Now it's regularly 39, 40 degrees, 41 degrees. What does that do to performance? This is the performance curve for your source or natus. Here's the optimal temperature, just about 35 and a half degrees. <clears throat> a shift towards uh, 39 results in uh, about a 25 to 30 percent decrease. Mm -hmm. If it goes up to 40, it results in an even higher decrement in performance. This means these little lizards are more likely to be tagged by uh, predators in these warmer environments. Now there, how's my time? Uh, it's about one. It's about one, okay, I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> there's some complications with performance curves, and that is um, food quality. I, remember I mentioned that uh, with trout you have a reduction in food availability. What does that do? Well, in 1971, John Brett uh, published a paper looking at the effects of uh, salmon with uh, changes in the uh, availability of food and how that is modified by temperature. And what he found is that as you change the ration available to salmon such that they go from excess to a substantially reduced amount of food, the optimal temperature for growth changes, as well as the rate at which they increase uh, the accumulation of somatic tissue. So we did a similar experiment with your source. We fasted lizards, and we fed them. And we found that these curves are significantly different. And what we found is that the preferred body temperature went down in fasted lizards from um, uh, 36 to 33, and the optimal temperature performance decreased from 36 or 37 to 35. And the, the breadth of uh, performance, the 95% uh, performance breadth, also shifted lower. Yeah, um, so what we see is, just, just to finish up, what we see is that if you look at the physiological capacities of organisms, both in terms of their preferred body temperatures, their performance capacities, and uh, their thermoregulatory behavior, it appears that organisms such as your source have the potential to adapt to changing environments by increasing temperature, but it comes at a cost. They can adjust to lower food availability, but again, there's a cost. We're noticing changes in survival and uh, recruitment that uh, are following these uh, uh, changes in the environment and changes in the physiological capacities of, of the organism. So with that, I'll take questions. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, if somebody could get the lights. Before we uh, take questions, I just wanted to mention we have one more uh, open slot uh, for a seminar speaker this semester. So if you would like to speak or know somebody who would like to, uh, shoot me an email. And I also wanted to mention uh, that Don is uh, in the office uh, right next to Ted Pappenfuss's office. Uh, so if you want to come talk to him, that's where you'll find him. So Don, will be here. Hi. First of all, it's sort of a trivial issue, maybe. I think of all the performance things you measure, endurance is the least significant. Because if you look at the behavior of these lizards, they nowhere push their endurance limits, I don't believe, under normal conditions. But more serious or significant, I think, would be a realm of their behavior or their physiology and life cycle you haven't addressed fully, and that's the reproductive cycle. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I recall everything that was done indicated that the most temperature sensitive system in a lizard is reproduction. Their, their ability to develop gonads and so on. And I wonder if these shifts are having an effect, say, on the timing of reproduction, which could screw up things greatly because most of these lizards, well, not most, many are not photoperiodic, 
so they're not fixed. And if they are photoperiodic, that fixes them to a time which may no longer be appropriate. Right. So I think reproduction is a key beyond caring live young. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about when they reproduce, mm -hmm. their ability, how many. I agree. I agree. I, did, I have data on that. I didn't present it. Uh, there, there's two things uh, we've noticed about um, uh, the, the population of Eurosaurus in uh, Tucson. One is um, the females use rainfall as a cue for reproduction. And two, um, they're starting to yoke up a clutch earlier in the year than um, they did in the 1980s. What's happening is females are carrying the eggs for a longer duration in the uterus, and um, they're becoming egg-bound. So the females can't lay the eggs until the soil moisture is high enough, and the uh, monsoon rains that the females use as a cue are, are variable in when they occur and variable in the intensity of rain when the rainfall event happens. So we're seeing uh, females that are enormous. Uh, by the time the monsoon rains start, or are supposed to start, like in July, uh, early July. Um, and we're also finding that the animals are active earlier in the year. In fact, the, the rumation period uh, normally would be from maybe November, uh, mid-November until uh, maybe late, Jan uh, late February, early March. But the, but the duration of time between the first frost and the last frost is shrinking, and so animals are coming out earlier. Uh, they're coming out at a lighter mass, and when they emerge, uh, there isn't sufficient food for them to put on enough weight to reproduce. So um, males are effectively burning out. So you find that males are uh, lighter in, in mass uh, early in the season, and uh, yeah, so you find there's a phenological change. And in another population um, that we've been studying in Europe, the common lizard, we find that lay date has advanced between two and three weeks because of uh, temperature, rising temperatures. And one of the outcomes of that is the um, change in uh, life history attributes. So, you know, there's this. Uh, uh, well-established trade-off between clutch size and offspring size. And what we found is that that trade-off has collapsed in the populations of uh, Lacerda that we've been studying. And in a manipulative experiment done by um, uh, Elvira Bastian and uh, her advisor Julian Cote and Jean, they showed that when they grew lizards in an environment that mimicked the IPCC projection, they were able to increase the number of clutches or litters that females produced. They increased the size of the young and the number of young, but at a cost of adult mortality. So they found overwinter mortality plum or increased, the survivorship plummeted. And they, the only mechanism they have is that they're burning up their energy reserves. So they're seeing a collapse in, in adult survivorship. And when they use population projection matrices, they find that the population projections for extinction are as early as 20 years. And so this is a lizard with a generation time of maybe four years, so five generations. But you're exactly right. There's phenological changes that should be included, and we have that data. That's good. Yeah. So um, presumably the ability of organisms to respond in an adaptive sense will also depend on how their thermal, thermal performance curves evolve. And I imagine that one of the best predictors of that would be spatial variation in thermal performance curves for a given species in relation to the conditions they experience. How does that, how do, how do those relationships look? Is there much variation within species in thermal per performance curves? Does it relate to the temperature they're experiencing or the... Or yes, the uh, that? yeah, that's a good question. So there, there is some data um, from um, Raoul Van Damme, where he, uh, uh, measured thermal performance curves along an elevational gradient in uh, Zotoka and found no difference. They, they're basically the same. Uh, but they do differ dramatically among species, right? They do differ dramatically among species. So that goes, that is the static versus liability argument. Now, my grad student, uh, 
Anthony Gilbert, uh, uh, measured thermal performance curves along an elevational gradient in Arizona. Now, the elevational gradient in Europe is not that great, maybe 500 to uh, 700 meters. Uh, we measured a gradient uh, that was about uh, 1,000 meters, and we found significant changes in the field active body temperature, or significant differences, significant differences in preferred temperature, and uh, shifts in the thermal performance curve. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, do this in a latitudinal uh, climb going from Mexico up to the northern limit of the species in Utah. And um, we're also uh, conducting uh, selection experiments. Uh, I, I have the data, I didn't present it, but we have evidence of selection on thermal preference. We have evidence of selection on uh, the thermal performance curve, the shape of the curve. And we also have correlational selection between uh, thermal preference and CT max. It's weak, but it's there. But that's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's critical, I think, for looking at how organisms respond. You have to have a, a spatial component to it. I mean, presumably the ones at the, the hottest environments they're not in hotter environments <coughs> yet, which suggests that there are some limits on the evolution of thermal performance curves. Yeah. But if they do vary spatially in the climate, one would expect that really the populations that are going to go extinct will only be essentially the ones at the lower end of the, at the hotter end of the distribution, mm -hmm. because the other ones should be able to evolve. However, right. if evolution is very slow at each location, and each one is favoring a shift in thermal performance curves, then you might actually expect range-wide extinction even though theoretically if they had enough time to evolve, they could get there if you gave them enough time. Exactly. One, one of the um, complicating factors with that is um, an increase in um, the preferred body temperature of a lizard uh, is also correlated with an increase in basking heat. And Barry did some experiments with Scalopris occidentalis. They showed that body temperature and basking behavior is uh, positively correlated. So if a lizard is going to increase its body temperature as a response, it's also going to have this behavioral shift which could create a feedback loop where animals are staying out longer, possibly pushing it closer to the thermal limit. Uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at that as well. You had one question. Yeah. Uh -huh. So in the polymorphic species, it different morphs or maybe like different body sizes and things like this. Are you seeing or have you looked at differential performance in like fitness and everything between morphs in a population? Yeah, so we've done that for Podarsis muralis that has three morphs, orange, yellow, and red. Uh, I'm sorry, white, yellow, and red. And we find that one of the morphs, the red morph, has a significantly different performance curve, uh, I believe. Um, but we don't have fitness data for the, for the morphs. Uh, this is just a kind of a pilot study. Uh, An Anthony is going to uh, do the, exactly that kind of experiment this coming year, where uh, he's <coughs> going to measure uh, the performance curves for different morphs. Uh, mark them, and then uh, look at their survival, and uh, test for differences in the, in the performance curves. We expect there are going to be differences because the morphs, uh, we know that they uh, exploit different food sources, they are found in different habitats. So we've used stable isotopic analyses to compare the, the diet of the morphs, and so you have a poly, color polymorphic species that also is polymorphic in diet. Uh, and there's also differences in the social network structure. So we are uh, going to evaluate uh, the selective uh, differences between morphs in terms of their performance, um, as well as uh, the proximity to other, other morphs. So Barry has shown that uh, the blue males are cooperative and they will repel the orange males, the superdominant males but at a cost to the yellow sneaker males um, parasitizing populations. 
but we don't have that similar di uh, dynamic in your source. It's more of a, a despotic or hierarchical system where there's a dominant male and there's subordinate males that kind of cluster around the dominant male. And so we don't see the same cycling of uh, morphs that you see in Yuda, which is, I mean, it's interesting. But it could be that there's you know, strong selection uh, operating on the morphs rather than the um, uh, oscillating selection one sees in, in Yuda. But that, yeah, that's um, the anticipated uh, program for Antoine. Great. Well, maybe if there are more questions, you can come up and ask Don or find him in his office, and let's thank him one more time. <laughs>